For those in the foyer, if you'd like to come on in, please take the time now to come on in as we transition into the next portion of our program. Uh, that portion will be the questions program, a uh, portion of the program between the two doctors here on stage. So our first point will be uh, Dr. Jacoby will be posing questions to Dr. Ali and Dr. Ali will answer and then uh, we're going to flip that. That'll be 10 minutes. So again, and so now um, uh, feel Dr. Free. Jacoby, I hand it over to you. So you're saying that the understanding of Jesus was radically transformed between the time of Mark 65 and John in the 90s. Uh, not only between Mark and John, but there's, there's a transformation of which uh, we have two uh, mileposts. We have Mark and we have John, and we can see the transformations that took place between Mark and, and John. Uh, you know, as a biblical scholar, how the gospel writers have shaped the tradition. We understand how oral tradition works, how written tradition works. Would you not say, though, that the fundamental level of the New Testament. At the earliest source, Jesus is already viewed as son of God, a term reserved for the emperor. It's a political statement in Mark 1.1 to say not Caesar is Lord, but Jesus is Lord. Would you not agree with that? Well, uh, Mark 1.1 actually is not uniform in the textual tradition, as you probably are aware. The I am. title Son of God in Mark 1.1 has been identified by some as not present in some of the earliest manuscripts, and this is why some modern translations of the New Testament omit Son of God in that particular mm. place. Mm -hmm. This does not mean that uh, Mark does not present Jesus as the Son of God, but the question uh, first of all is, what kind of Son of God is Mark referring to? Is he referring to Jesus as metaphorically the Son of God or an adopted Son of God? And when he quotes the centurion as saying, this man is the Son of God, according to some uh, Bible translations, that should probably be translated, this man is a Son of God, because for the Roman centurion, there were many sons of God. God. So, so he, the Roman centurion conceivably would not have at this stage thought that God has only one son and this is the son. It's, he's probably thinking this is a son, which means a righteous man. As Luke put it in his gospel, the centurion said, truly this man is innocent. So that's another way of saying this man is innocent if we put the two gospels together. Right, but in, in, if you want the latest version of the Greek New Testament based on the oldest versions, it came out at the end of last year. It's right here. And Mark 1.1, 1, 1, the full version is there. That's the weight of uh, the consensus that, that that is legitimate. Well, but okay. I mean, you're seeing a consensus, and, and that's fine. I will bow to biblical uh, scholarship. Good point. We, so we have to, yeah, uh, some things are more conclusive than others. Yes. It, in Mark, as I've mentioned, Jesus acts as though he's God, forgiving sins, third party, describing himself at the end of coming back in the clouds. In Isaiah, in Psalms, in the prophets, that's what God does. He does a lot of things that God, God walks on the sea in Job. In Mark, Jesus walks on the sea. There's so many things. And we don't just have to talk about Mark, but, you know, Philip says, show us the Father, that will be enough. Well, Jesus isn't the Father, he's the Son. But he says, don't you know me, Philip? Anyone who sees me sees the Father because in nature, they're not equal in rank or attribute, but they're equal in nature. Okay, so let me respond. First yes. of all, with Mark 1.1, 1, 1, while I would like to bow to scholarship, I'd like to, uh, it to be known that uh, the scholarship is not uniform. For example, Adela Yarbo Collins, in her Arminea commentary on, on Mark 1.1, uh, 1, 1, uh, uh, just translates it, uh, this is the beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, full stop. No son of God at that point, and she explains the reason, because this is not present in some of the most uh, reliable early manuscripts. As for uh, the gospel of Mark and others presenting Jesus as being more than a human being, more than a prophet, or that he does things which we know that God in the Old Testament did, th that is not by definition what is meant by Son of God. Like, we have to have a definition. What is meant by Son of God? God, Son of God, as you defined it, is uh, that one who was eternally uh, begotten of God. I don't know if you use the term begotten in your presentation. No, but I but, could have, yeah. But you would agree to that. He's eternally begotten of God. All right. So then, uh, so Jesus walks on water. How do you know that 
that he was eternally begotten of God. All you know that he has is that he has a great, lot of great power allowing him to walk on water. So he could have been a prophet whom God allowed to have this power to walk on water. Satan has a lot of great power, uh, but uh, Satan is not considered by Christians or anyone else to be the son of God, eternally begotten of God. So uh, you have to have something that clinches it to say, well, this is what we're going to call Jesus because that's what son of God means. Well, and, and as and a term that, was, that term was already in circulation as a term for the Messiah, as we know from the Dead Sea Scrolls and, and intertestamental literature. Jesus says, before Abraham was born, I am. Ego in me, you know that phrase appears over and over in John, and it's the name of God in Exodus 3. Okay, but, but, but notice what you're doing here with, with quoting previously Philip's question to Jesus, uh, show us the Father, and then Jesus saying, whoever has seen me has seen the Father, and now you are quoting John's Gospel again. What you're doing here is you're confirming my general thesis that uh, there has been a development such oh. that when Christians mm. want to find proofs that Jesus is either the Son of God in that ontological sense, or that he is God, you more likely find the proofs in John's Gospel. But I I don't want to neglect what you said about Mark's gospel when Jesus spoke about the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven. Bruce Chilton, a New Testament scholar, has uh, written an article in Bible Review in which uh, he examined the sayings about the Son of Man very carefully in Mark's gospel. And he says that sometimes Jesus is speaking to himself uh, about himself with that title, Son of Man. Yes, I'm but aware. Sometimes Jesus is speaking about another figure to come in the future uh, who will be somehow associated with Jesus, but it's not Jesus. So that great son of man who will come in the future in Mark's gospel is uh, not Jesus according to Bruce Chilton. It's somebody else because Br Jesus is always referring to that son of man in the third person. It, Jesus, and he does often refer to himself in the, thir in, in the third person. I don't deny that. Uh, Chilton's a fine scholar, but one of many. I mean, in a few weeks, I'll be at the biblical, the big conference in Denver. There are 10,000 biblical scholars there. Uh, we can find a scholar here and there to back us up on one thing or another, but we need to learn from them as a whole, not just cherry pick our favorite scholar to back up our point. Uh, Jesus is presented as divine more in John than in Mark. I'll agree with that. I'm just saying he's presented as divine. It's not Caesar who is God and Savior. It's Jesus. And that's the way he's portrayed. And I would challenge anyone in the audience to read Mark's gospel and say he's a prophet and he's not God's son. Yeah, but I take it you're asking me questions here, right? These are questions for me to respond to. Let me, let me respond to that very well, quickly. Can, can, Mark, I, can I just interrupt yes, and say... You can do anything. Are, are, <laughs> um, are there questions? Because again, you will have the ability to, to ask Doug and there will be some rebuttals. Yeah. So we do have just under three minutes all left. Right. So let, let me, um, I want to make sure that all the questions are asked and then you'll yeah. be able to ask these questions. Well, sure, Michelle, sure. that won't happen because but, I, but I here, have four Doug, more let, here. let me respond to what you just said. Um, so you're asking about Mark's presentation of Jesus and you're saying, okay, in John, Jesus appears more divine than he was in, in Mark's gospel. No, he's uh, portrayed as uh, divine more often. More often, more not, often. Not okay. a degree difference. Let me not put words in your mouth, but let me get to the answer to that. In, in Mark's gospel taken as a whole, it is very clear that Jesus is a, a great prophet. Uh, he has uh, he is God's Messiah. Uh, he has great powers, but he also has limitations. This is what is very important to understand in Mark's gospel. So in Mark's gospel, Jesus denies that he has uh, omniscience. He right. says of that hour, no one knows, not even the Son, but only the Father. Right. So if Jesus does not have omniscience, then he is not God. A, a man came to Jesus and asked him, good teacher, what must I do to have eternal life? And Jesus says, says to him, why do you call me good? No one is good but God alone. So Jesus is distancing himself from being praised to such an extent. Moreover, Jesus in some of his miracles obviously has limitations. Mark says he could not do any mighty works in his hometown. But of course, the later gospels change this from could not do to did not do, if we go to Matthew and Luke. So if Jesus healed some in, in, in a certain occasion in Mark's gospel, he healed them all in Matthew and Luke. You see a difference. I don't deny the, the, the differences, and I don't deny those differences at all. Uh, do, but do we have time for these questions? Um, let me give you one, because maybe we'll circle back with some of this material when we trade roles in a second. You have a minute and a half. In, the, in Islam, the Quran, it, by the majority of Islamic scholars, is considered to be eternal and uncreated, right? 
Um, uh, these are, are terms that came up in Muslim discussions right. in, in, the, um, in the middle of medieval times. Yes. Uh, I, I don't want to revive those discussions now because uh, well, I can't a lot revive, of this... I can't revive the discussion. I thought Miroslav Wolf did a great job in his book, Allah, uh, explaining where that came from. But unless I'm misrepresenting Muslims, the Quran is eternal and uncreated. So is Allah. I'm in Christianity, sorry, which we book have... did you refer to? In Christianity, we have a Father, Son, and Spirit being eternal and uncreated. In yeah. Islam, you have the Quran joining Allah as eternal and uncreated. And were, were you referring to a book that discussed this uh, eternal uncreatedness of the Quran? Is that what you were referring to? No, you didn't. Okay. So I just oh, want no, to make no, sure I, I heard I mean, your question correctly. I was correctly. reading about a few years when, when Wolf's yes. new book came out. I, was, I, I read right. it there. Now, the difference is so you have two. Let, let me answer it very quickly because we only have half a minute remaining. Uh, so uh, uh, when, uh, the, the reason I don't want to get into this is that a lot of it is semantics. Like, what do you mean when you refer to the book of God? So some Muslims said it is not eternal and uncreated because by the Quran, they meant the knowledge of God. And of course, the God's knowledge is uh, eternal and uncreated. As some who said that the Quran was created, they're referring to the physical object in our hands. And obviously, it's written on paper which was created, with ink which was created, and so on. So uh, here, Muslims debated with each other without properly defining their terms. So it is a non-issue, really. So this doesn't perfectly match the Quran in heaven. Uh, if I had time, I would have answered you. <laughs> I'll allow the answer. Okay, uh, so what we would say is that the Quran we have in our hands now uh, is a representation of that message which God wants uh, us to have for our salvation, and that message is already in the mind of God, and the mind of God is uh, reflected in what is called the lawhul mahfuz because it is related in a tradition. He said to the pen, write, and the pen asked, what should I write? And he said, uh, my knowledge of all things that will happen up until uh, the the last day. You're talking about Surah so, 25? Uh, not, I'm speaking about a tradition, not some uh, passage of the Quran. Not and this too shows that it's, it, okay. it's something outside of the, of the Quranic uh, requirement. Uh, this is something that comes up in Muslim discourse, largely based on what is mentioned in uh, other sources. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right. Uh, for those who are...